I'm uh, Kevin Cameron, uh, at least I suspect so, and I want to talk about how crankshafts and connecting rods are brought together. The earliest motorcycles had five-piece crankshafts. There were two main shafts. The main shafts are the ones that just revolve. There was a crank pin, which went around in an orbit, and there were two flywheels. And the main shafts fitted into the flywheels with tapers and nuts, and the same thing for the crank pin, so you had those five pieces. The connecting rod was a one-piece affair. So you assembled the bearing onto the crank pin, you slid the rod onto the bearing, you put the other flywheel on the end of the crank pin, you did up the tapers and nuts, you lined it all up with hammers and dial gauges, and you had yourself a crankshaft. As you can imagine, being assembled from all those pieces meant that there were at least that many failure modes. So very early there was a desire to simplify matters by making a one-piece crankshaft and having the connecting rod come apart into two pieces so that you could assemble this over the crank pin, put the bearings in, put the cap on, and then do up the nuts. During the 1960s when Honda so tremendously elevated the art of tiny racing engines by building 50cc twins, a 125cc five cylinder, 250 and 297cc six cylinders. All of those engines had one piece connecting rods and crankshafts that were assembled by pressing all these pieces together. How in the world did they make it reliable enough to even finish a race? Honda realized that that was never going to be the key to making a mass-produced product. So when they introduced the CB750 inline four in 1969, it had split and bolted connecting rods and a one-piece forged crankshaft. Steel, one piece, very rugged. That's the way MotoGP engines, Formula One engines are built to this day. But for a long time, the one-piece connecting rod assembled onto a crankshaft that came apart into multiple pieces to permit such an assembly was the way things were done. There was also the controversy as to whether a rolling bearing, this is a needle bearing connecting rod big end bearing, this is a standard Conrad ball bearing, whether it was nobler in the mind to have the very precise seeming and so smooth running rolling bearing or this crude seeming plane bearings. Now what happens here is that before this goes on to the crank pin you take a piece like this but in scale set it into here there's a little notch that corresponds with this tang to locate the bearing so that it can't move this way. When the bearings are in both sides the thing is assembled the nuts are torqued up then there's a clearance to the crank pin of maybe 1.2 thousandths or so. And that turns out to be superior in almost every way to the rolling bearing. Very strange. Porsche hung on until about 1962 to the idea of a built up crankshaft made of multiple pieces with one piece rods. The same controversy went on in the airplane field. Here is a one-piece master rod from a Pratt & Whitney R2800. There are two master rods like this in a 2800, and the assembled engine produces anywhere up to 3100 horsepower. This one has regrettably been chromed, but it is a beautiful thing. All of its shapes are quite curvaceous and organic. They're looking to prevent stress concentration. These people found that it was better for them to make the crankshaft come apart and make the rod in one piece. But in automotive practice and in motorcycles, it has proved that a one piece crankshaft and split and bolted connecting rods with plain bearings 
is the best solution.